if looks could kill. The Casanova killer, known for his good looks and violent tendencies, Paul John Knowles was an unpredictable serial spree killer throughout the 1970s. From an early childhood of delinquency in foster homes, Paul's upbringing led to a series of at least 18 murders that continued until his death at only 28 years old. Though 18 murders are documented, it is claimed that the body count goes all the way to 35. So how did he do it, and why? Well, all that and more as we explore the anatomy of murder. Paul John Knowles went through childhood never truly having a place to call home. Hopping from foster home to foster home in Orlando, Florida, a lack of consistency and familial love are nothing but recipes for disaster. His petty crimes in early childhood progressed into adulthood, landing Paul in jail numerous times for crimes such as burglary. Unfortunately for Paul, he never learned his lesson, no matter how many times he was incarcerated. At 19 years old, he was imprisoned at Ryford Prison, a stronghold that donned the name The Four Walls of Ryford. His time spent in prison weren't all that bad. During one extended visit of the correctional facility, he became pen pals with Angela Kovic, a woman who felt deeply for him while he only viewed her as an opportunity. If he could get this woman to fall in love with him, he might have had a way out. She could bring in money to buy him out of his cage by paying legal fees. Faking emotions and turning on his charm seemed to be a small price to pay to escape. Paul was able to persuade Angela of his feelings for her and eventually proposed to her while still in prison. Angela accepted Paul's proposal and for the Casanova killer, everything was going according to plan. However, this would not last long. While Paul was finding a way to California to move in with her, Angela visited a psychic who gave her an ominous foresight. She was told there was a new violent presence in her life. Astonished by her meeting with the psychic, she dumped old Casanova before he could finalize his move. This was the spark that ignited the killer within. Allegedly, three lives were lost that same night, but these are not confirmed. What we do know is that within two months, Paul went back to Florida and very shortly after got involved in a violent bar fight in which he was arrested. However, he managed to escape with his adept lockpicking skills. His escape led to his first documented victim. Alice Curtis, a 65-year-old woman, was an innocent victim. While she was keeping to herself inside her house, she had something Paul wanted, a car and money. Based on her house's convenient location, Paul invaded her house on July 26, 1974. During their confrontation, he gagged her as he robbed her of her valuables. She choked on the gag and her own dentures and died that night, while Paul staged his getaway with the car, a Dodge Dart. On his way to abandoning his stolen vehicle just a week later on August 2nd, Paul came across two girls who he worried witnessed his acts. These girls were Lillian and Milette Anderson, ages 11 and 7. In his desperate paranoia, he abducted the girls to eliminate witnesses. When they were discovered to be missing by parents and police, they were certain that the children did not merely walk off. Both the Andersons have thyroid issues and needed to take medicine regularly. These girls were never found. Paul was able to abduct, rape, and murder the girls, and after disposing of the bodies in a nearby swamp, move on to his next kill. Just one day goes by and another victim claimed. Marjorie Howe had a television that Paul wanted, and he always gets what he wants. Another home invasion leads to another strangulation, this time with a nylon stocking. The Casanova killer got his television, and Howe dies at the age of 49. Eventually, the killing stopped being an afterthought and became part of the thrill for Paul. His notoriety was going to his head, and he began to kill purely for sport. This marks the demise of 13-year-old Imogene Sanders, a hitchhiker from Georgia unfortunate enough to come across this psychopath. With no ulterior motive of Paul, she was raped and murdered. The exact time of her death is unknown, but she originally went missing on August 1st, 1974. 
A short lull of bloodshed lasted until August 23rd, where Paul invaded yet another home and with a telephone cord strangled Kathy Pierce to death while her three-year-old son watched the entire thing happen. While reports say he left the child unharmed, being forced to witness the murder of your loving parent in cold blood can obviously lead to permanent psychological trauma. It would be a miracle if the boy ended up turning out okay. Women were not the only victims of the Casanova killer's bloodlust. In early September, a night out at the bar and a couple of beers turned deadly. Paul shared a few drinks in Lima with Ohio resident William Bates, which eventually led to Bates being strangled, robbed, and murdered, his wallet and car stolen from him. Bates' nude body wasn't found until October, lost in the woods. It was here that Alice's Dodge Dart was finally put to rest as well. Two weeks later, on September 18th, two more lives were fed to the monster that was Paul John Knowles. While some people enjoy going into the great outdoors while camping in Nevada, breathing in the fresh air and fastening your bond with nature, it also opens you up to the dangers of nature. While usually we refer to wild animals as beasts, Paul might suffice for something just as dangerous. After maxing out poor William Bates' credit cards, he had to find a place to stay for a short while. This meant another invasion. Unlike the previous murders, this elderly couple was not strangled to death, but shot in their small retreat in the woods. But he was far from finished. The next murder shows that no matter where we are, danger might be imminent. Three days later, 42-year-old Sherilyn Hicks merely stopped by the side of the road to sightsee in Seguin, Texas, after her motorcycle broke down. Completely unprovoked, the Casanova killer shows up seemingly out of nowhere to help her. He snatched her up, raped her, and strangled her to death. Her mangled body was then dragged through barbed wire. After your first broken heart, sometimes it feels impossible to recover. We all do crazy, sometimes violent things when we're upset, but eventually the heart moves on and we find someone else. This happened for Paul. He met a woman by the name of Ann Dawson, and the couple hit it off and traveled together for about a week. Then he got sick of her and did away with her on September 29th, leaving no traces of a body. Three weeks later in Connecticut, Karen Wine and her 16-year-old daughter were bound, raped, and strangled to death with a nylon stocking. While there isn't much information about this murder, what Paul ended up stealing leads to an important turn of events. The only thing missing from the Wine's house was a tape recorder. Three days later, the Casanova killer struck again. On October 19th, Doris Hovey's home was invaded, and the 53-year-old woman was shot with her husband's rifle. Taking extra time to be meticulous, Paul wiped his prints from the gun and placed it by her body. There was no evidence to trace the murder to him. Moving back to Florida, Paul picks up two hitchhikers, which would have been his next targets. Luck was on their side, however, when a police officer pulled Paul over for a traffic violation. Luck was also on Paul's side, however, and the officer left with only a warning. Anxious from the police confrontation, he let the hitchhikers go and called a lawyer. He refused to surrender to the police, but met with his lawyer to provide a confession recorded with the tape recorder taken from the Wines' home. November 6th led to one of the more disturbing murders. He was invited to the home of a man named Carswell Carr, where Paul was going to stay overnight, and the two decided to have a few drinks. During this, Paul stabs Carswell, but he dies from a heart attack. The fun didn't stop there for Paul. There was a 15-year-old daughter there, too, who he strangled to death. Following this, Paul unsuccessfully attempted necrophilia on the 15-year-old girl's body. The last murders were of patrol trooper Charles Eugene Campbell and James Meyer. Campbell noticed the stolen car Paul recently acquired after abandoning Bates' vehicle, but couldn't successfully arrest the killer. Paul got the best of him took him hostage, and took his patrol car until he could find a less conspicuous car to drive, owned by James Meyer, who became the second hostage. He took his handcuffed prisoners to a secluded area in Pulaska County, Georgia, and shot them both in the head at point-blank range. Paul's rampage ends as he attempts to drive through a police roadblock, causing him to lose control of his car and crash into a tree. After an intense chase by police officers, attack dogs, and helicopters, he's caught by none other than your everyday armed citizen, subjugated in a citizen's arrest until the cops arrived. While in custody, Paul confessed to 35 murders, though only 18 of these were verified. 
The Casanova wouldn't go down without a fight, however, and he met his demise on November 18th during transfer to a high-security prison. With a paperclip in hand, Paul breaks free of his handcuffs and attempts to escape by reaching for an officer's revolver. His arrogance led to him being shot dead by FBI agent Ron Angel, ending the tyranny of Paul John Knowles for good. That's all for now. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to check out my last episode of Twisted Tens and my comedy series, Why Would You Put That on the Internet? You can press on screen to see both. And of course, be sure to subscribe because you won't want to miss what's next. And I'll see you next time.